Right now, I am standing on the Antietam battlefield, which on September 17th of 1862 was the site of the bloodiest day in American history. So if you've been following along with this Antietam miniseries that we've been doing, uh, just to, to kind of recap, uh, what's going on is you have McClellan and his Army of the Potomac squaring off against Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, the, the battle starts off to, to the north of me here in the cornfield where uh, the, the First Corps under Joseph Hooker is moving south to slam into Jackson's troops. And there's some back and forth motion that goes on there. And then the Union 12th Corps enters the battle. And what you start seeing on both sides is McClellan and Lee are just feeding people into the fight here on the northern end of the battlefield. Well, after the 1st Corps and the 12th Corps of the Union came in, it was the 2nd Corps' turn. And leading the attack for the 2nd Corps was going to be a division under General Sedgwick and they were going to be moving right across this section of the battlefield. And what they didn't know is they were about ready to stick their face into a buzzsaw. To me, this might be one of the more unique monuments on the battlefield. Here you can see that uh, this monument is arranged as uh, three rifles that are lashed together with a, uh, a bucket underneath as if it's uh, you know over a fire and, and cooking something. And it says, here fought the 90th Pennsylvania, September 17th, 1862, a hot place. The spot where I'm standing right now is kind of just to the south of Miller's Cornfield and just at the west end of the East Woods. Now, as I already mentioned, on the morning of the 17th, uh, to, to the north, uh, you would have had the First Corps attacking the Confederate lines. And then off to the northeast, uh, after the, the First Corps had made their run, you have the 12th Corps that is coming online. Uh, their Corps commander, a guy by the name of Mansfield, was mortally wounded in that attack. And coming in after the 12th Corps, as you know, the, the Confederates and Union were kind of pushing each other back and forth in waves across these battlefields, uh, you would have had Sumner's Second Corps. And leading off the assault, right here, forming up along the, the western end of the East Woods, uh, would have been a division under the leadership of General Sedgwick. Now, as the Second Corps was getting in formation, for some reason that nobody knows, uh, there was an order given to uh, another regiment in the 12th Corps called the 125th Pennsylvania, which would have been right out here, to go and make an attack across this field towards the Dunkard Church and clear out that area of woods of any Confederate skirmishers. And these poor guys had no idea what they were getting ready to run into. I do want to make a quick note of something. If you come out to Antietam, uh, one thing that you need to be careful of is groundhog holes. These things are everywhere, and uh, that, that is a knee snapper right there. Uh, so, September 17th of 1862, you would have had to have worried about becoming a, a casualty of artillery fire and uh, rifle fire. Well, now, you, you really have to worry about becoming a casualty of a groundhog hole.
Now, the 125th Pennsylvania set out from the East Woods, crossed uh, what was a clover field in that big field that I showed earlier, and they would have crossed the Hagerstown Pike and entered into this area right here. This is the West Woods that is just north of the Dunker Church. And the, they were being led by a guy named Colonel Jacob Higgins. Something to keep in mind about the 125th, five weeks before Antietam, these guys were just regular civilians. They were brand new to combat. So five weeks before, they had been farmers and shop clerks and blacksmiths. And, and now, here at Antietam, in this spot, they were about ready to be thrown into the cauldron against uh, the Confederates under the command of Jubal Early, who Lee called his bad old man. Hey, look at here. Looks like we have another visitor at the uh, 125th Pennsylvania Monument this morning. Well, this knoll right here is where the 125th Pennsylvania was going to be making their stand against Jubal Early. So the position where I'm standing right now is kind of like the, the Confederate view of this engagement. Uh, leading off the assault on the 125th was going to be the 49th Virginia Regiment. And uh, they were going to, to make a, a couple of pushes up here on this knoll that was going to be pushed back by the 125th. Uh, and eventually, the it, it became too much for, for these new Pennsylvania soldiers. And uh, if you look here on the 125th Pennsylvania Monument, well, this individual that is depicted here is George Simpson, who was the color sergeant for the 125th. He ends up getting shot in the head, and then things kind of just melt for the 125th. Uh, they end up holding as long as they can, uh, but whenever the order is given to retreat, uh, it, it becomes kind of a disorganized route. Uh, men are, are just running back towards the, the East Woods. And here you can see that it says the losses at Antietam killed and died of wounds, 54, seriously wounded, 91, um, and then slightly wounded and not reported, 84, for a total of 229. Now there's a, another monument here for the 34th New York Infantry. And uh, the direction that I'm facing now is, is kind of north. The, the 34th New York Infantry was part of Sedgwick's divis division. And uh, for some reason, they kind of went off course and ended up over here too. But uh, the, the deciding factor here on this knoll right by the Dunker Church was the entrance of Lafayette McClaws' division. They're going to come from the direction that I'm standing right now, and we're going to head this way. And as Sedgwick is moving to the position of the West Woods, he has no idea that McClaws is about ready to slam right into his flank. Okay, well, I've moved back out now to the area that is the western end of the East Woods. As a matter of fact, here in the distance, you can, you can see the, the cornfield. And as the 125th Pennsylvania was fighting it out on that knoll just on the other side of the Dunker Church, uh, Sedgwick's division was setting out from approximately this area. Now, Sedgwick was going to have three brigades that were going to be in line, one right after the other. The, the leading brigade was going to be led by a guy named Willis Gorman. The one right after him was led by a guy who has the coolest name in the Civil War. Uh, his name was Napoleon Jackson Tecumseh Dana, uh, the coolest name ever. And after him was going to be one of my favorite guys in the Civil War, Oliver Otis Howard. So right now, we are walking through this area that uh, would have been like either a clover field or, or a, a stubble field on September 17th of 1862. 
and we're following the approximate line that Sedgwick's division would have followed. And soldiers who were making this march or making this charge uh, described the scene that lay before them as they were making their way to the west here. So you can just imagine this entire field being covered in, in blood and there's the dead and the wounded and men uh, begging you for water and you're having to like sidestep to, to not uh, trample the, the dead or the wounded. This would have been a grisly sight as these men were making their way across this field and heading right over here into the West Woods. And unbeknownst to them, the 125th was about ready to collapse. So Sedgwick's division makes their way across the field. They cross the Hagerstown Pike, which is just right over here in, in this direction, and they cross over into the West Woods. So first you have Gorman's Brigade who is moving through here, followed closely by Dana's Brigade. And then bringing up the rear is the Philadelphia Brigade under Oliver Otis Howard. And as they enter into the West Woods, Oliver Otis Howard looks off to his left and he sees the 125th Pennsylvania retreating, heading back towards the East Woods. And he thinks, oh, okay, well, those are the troops that we are sent in to relieve. What he doesn't know is that they've been routed, and following them is going to be the division of McClaws, led by a very aggressive Confederate commander uh, by the name of William Barksdale, who was leading a group of Mississippians right into the flank. So they hit Howard uh, in the flank, the Corps Commander Sumner is seeing all of this happen, and he says, my God, we must get out of this. Now, if my description of what happened here wasn't quite clear, perhaps this aerial map will clean it up a little bit. So here is where we are standing right now. Uh, right back in here in this direction would be the East Woods. Sedgwick's division is moving in this direction, and McClaw's his division, led by Barksdale's brigade, are moving in right through here, and, and right here is where uh, Sedgwick's left flank is going to be hit. What we are looking at here is a monument to the Philadelphia Brigade, and uh, as it says there, it's the Army of the Potomac uh, 2nd Brigade. And it says the, the Philadelphia Brigade took part in the operations, battles, and skirmishes of the Army of the Potomac from Balls Bluff to Appomattox during term of service 1861 to 1865 with a total loss of 3,409 men. And this is going to give us a good reference point to what happens here. So right now, I'm facing west. So this is the direction that Gorman and Dana have already moved in. So they've gone into those woods. And uh, this is where, where Oliver Otis Howard's uh, brigade is going to be, the Philadelphia Brigade. If we look this direction, this is where William Barksdale's brigade of Mississippians is going to come out and hit them right in the flank. Now, Sumner was trying to get Howard's attention, and he was like shouting as loud as he could, but it was so loud that Howard couldn't hear him, and he's trying to tell him to get out. Howard said that he could notice by his gestures uh, what he wanted. So... This, this third line of the Philadelphia Brigade is going to fall back. They're going to hit the Hagerstown Pike, and they're going to go north uh, back towards the Poffenberger Farm, where they're going to reform their lines. Now, in this direction, as I've already mentioned, Gorman's Brigade and Dana's Brigade are already uh, well ahead, and... Uh, they are also going to get hit in the flank by Barksdale's Mississippians. The problem is that they are really, really close together, and the men in Dana's brigade are, are shifting their focus, and they're trying to shoot at the Mississippians, but they're hitting Gorman's brigade in the back. 
So, so the guys in that lead element who were on the left-hand side are getting shot from the front by the Confederates and they're getting shot in the back from the Union. Uh, some of the guys who were in, in Dana's brigade in the middle realized what was going on and they couldn't do anything. They couldn't shoot back uh, because they were risking shooting their own men. All they could stand, do is stand there and just get shot at. And it's, it's right up here in this area uh, that Dana is going to be wounded. A historian in the 19th Massachusetts in Dana's brigade described this. He said the brigade descended into a wood where death was holding high revel. And just like Howard's brigade, uh, Dana's brigade was, was going to have to fall back. So right now, I've made my way through the West Woods, and I'm actually at the, the western end of the West Woods. You can probably hear a modern road here just in front of me. And I'm following the path of the lead brigade of Sedgwick's division that, again, was being led by Gorman's brigade. Uh, now, Gorman's brigade, in spite of the fact that they were being torn up with canister shot from Hauser's Ridge just to the, the west of us, uh, they thought that they were doing pretty good and holding up. They had no idea that behind them, Barksdale's brigade had completely driven uh, the the second and third line off of the field. And uh, they were really at risk of being enveloped. Well, right here on the western end of the West Woods, we have a monument to the 15th Regiment of the Massachusetts Volunteers. Uh, so this marks pretty much, just in general, the, the furthest advance of the lead brigade of Sedgwick's division under Gorman. Uh, you would have had Dana's brigade another 40 or 50 yards to the east of this brigade, and then Howard's brigade would have been another 40 or 50 yards beyond. So everybody in this division would have been packed within about 100 yards of each other. And uh, the 15th Regiment of the Massachusetts Volunteers has the dubious distinction of having 340 casualties, was, which numerically was the highest number of casualties on the battlefield that day. And you can see at the top, well, here is this, this wounded lion uh, who, has, who has been injured, but as you can see, has a paw up and is still in the fight. And if we go back here, well, we can see a list of names of every individual in this regiment who was killed or who later died of their wounds. The fighting that took place here in the West Woods would be a disaster for Sedgwick's division. Out of the 5,300 men that entered the West Woods, 2,200 would become casualties. And Sedgwick himself would be one of those casualties. He was hit three times and he was able to hold for about another hour before he had to turn command over to Oliver Otis Howard. But uh, McClaw's division just absolutely uh, did unspeakable damage to, to Sedgwick's division. They ended up pushing back up towards the, the Poffenberger farm north of here, uh, but Howard had reestablished his line and the Union artillery was able to, to help stem that advance and that counterattack. And uh, the fighting was pretty much going to come to a close along the Hagerstown Pike. But the fighting was not over here at Antietam. Just to the south, the other two divisions of Sumner's 2nd Corps were about to become hotly engaged in some of the most brutal action here at Antietam at a place that would later become known as the Bloody Lane. Mm -hmm. 